Welcome, everybody. My name is John Stack. I'm executive director of the School of International and Public Affairs and associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I am thrilled to invite you to a special evening. We hope that this will generate uh, a conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Mora, Ambassador Duddy, and Professor Javier Corrales. Uh, I think this is a fabulous opportunity. I want to acknowledge the support from uh, the co-sponsorship from the Ruth K. and Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecture Series uh, in SEPA. Uh, I want to thank Ambassador Duddy and Professor Corrales for accepting FIU's invitation to participate in this important and timely uh, event. Uh, as a student of international relations, although not a Latin Americanist, Venezuela is very important, I think, to the United States, to our strategic policy, uh, the petrodollars it has, it, its petrodollars has the capacity to project itself in the Americas and the world in a significant way. What happens in Venezuela will have consequences not only for Cuba uh, uh, and the transition to democracy there, but in fact for our hemisphere. Now, it's a special privilege and honor for me to introduce Frank Mora, whom I've known for more than 20 years, and I'll tell you a story. Uh, about 20 years ago, I got a call from uh, one, of the, one of the great professors at the University of uh, Miami who called me and said, John, I have a fabulous graduate student, and he really needs to teach. Uh, will you hire him? Well, not knowing Frank Moore, I put him through his paces. I had him come out and interview. Uh, and uh, my colleagues loved him. And uh, you know, it would be a, an act of hubris to say that his career was launched at FIU uh, as he was finishing his graduate degree, but our students responded to them so that as we uh, conducted a two-year search for the very best person in the world to lead LAC, uh, I was thrilled that uh, Frank Moore immediately came to the top uh, of the search, and it is simply wonderful to have him here. So I want to welcome you to uh, LAC uh, and the uh, School of International and Public Affairs. And Frank, I want to turn over the event to you now. Welcome, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Are we okay? Well, thank you, thank you, Dr. Stack, and thank you for that very, very kind uh, introduction. I also want to thank all of you for being here uh, this evening. Uh, this is really we're launching a first of a series of what we're calling conversations with, um, and we're we're doing things a little differently in terms of the format. That rather than having a panel where people will present paper or there would be a speaker. Uh, I like the, the informal nature of a conversation that we want to have with both distinguished academics in their fields as well as practitioners. And I'm very grateful to um, our, our two guests who really exemplify exactly that kind of or those kinds of individuals. Uh, let me just take a few minutes to introduce uh, our two guests, so, and we can then start the introduction. We're, we're going to go for about 45 minutes or so in the conversation, and then, of course, we're going to turn it over to, to the audience for your, your questions uh, and, and, your, and your comments. Uh, first, uh, uh, Ambassador Patrick Duddy, I think, um, as I mentioned, exemplifies uh, someone uh, that has had a long and very distinguished career uh, in the Foreign Service working on Latin America. Uh, in the contemporary era, in the last 20 years, I, I can honestly say that he is one of a very few Latin American policy hands that we've had in the State Department. Uh, he is, as everyone knows, was the ambassador uh, to uh, Venezuela from uh, 07 to 10, but of course that wasn't uh, his last or only position. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary 
of State uh, for South American and Economic Affairs issues. He's been throughout the Americas having served in, I don't know, countless countries in different positions to include uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, a number two person in our embassy uh, in La Paz. I met him back in 1993 when he was serving even as DCM or acting DCM in, in Paraguay. Uh, that was an interesting time. He has now uh, realized that the real life and career is in the academic world and not in the policy <laughs> world. And so he's currently uh, at Duke University working in the Center for International Studies as a visiting senior uh, lecturer. Uh, thank you for, for joining us, uh, Ambassador. And then uh, as an academic, uh, I think uh, uh, if I could say so myself, I couldn't have picked a better, a better scholar to share with us and discuss issues related to Venezuela. Uh, professor Javier Corrales is a professor of political science at Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts. He's a graduate of Harvard University where he received his PhD in political science. Uh, he is the author of, as far as I can count, six books already and countless academic and policy articles. His most recent book uh, is very timely, and that is a book on U.S.-Venezuelan relations that he co-authored with Carlos Romero, and there are some tidbits there that I want to share with all of you, so it's a good plug for uh, the book. Uh, he's not only uh, written on Venezuela, he spent some time uh, in Venezuela as a Fulbright scholar where he, he did a lot of research and taught there at the School of uh, Government, I'm sorry, at the Institute of Higher Studies uh, uh, in Administration in Caracas. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have him as well. And then again, I want to emphasize <coughs> the practitioner and the scholar. Uh, and we're going to have and start a conversation. Gentlemen, again, thank you for, for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me, let me start with the sort of the inevitable question, right? Uh, is it inevitable that, or was it written in stone, that the relationship between the United States and Venezuela from 1999 when uh, President Chavez came into office as ambassador, that this was doomed to fail? I mean, that, that the relationship was doomed to be a confrontational relationship, and perhaps we should have realized that back in 1999. It's a good question, um, Frank. Um, I would su suggest that in the first instance, it was not obvious early in um, the tenure of Hugo Chavez that the relationship would become as toxic as it has become over the years. Certainly, um, there were concerns because of his, uh, his that is to say, President uh, Chavez's uh, personal history. Um, but I would also say that the, uh, the strain of anti-Americanism um, that became increasingly evident in the last four or five years of his tenure um, was less pronounced early on. And if there was, um, if you were, uh, if you will, a, a set of, of circumstances that many hoped would mitigate um, President Chavez's suspicions of uh, the United States, it was the fact that, that we uh, were then, as we remain to this day, uh, Venezuela's principal commercial partner. You know, and Venezuela, of course, has, has long supplied oil to the United States. Even now, and they supply much less than they did formerly, but even now they're among the top five suppliers of, of crude oil, uh, foreign suppliers of crude oil to the United States. Um, in the year 2012, I think, even in this um, very difficult moment historically, it's worth noting that the commercial relationship totaled something on the order of $56 billion. Professor Corrales, I mean, if you could sort of touch on that as well, but was, was the April 2002 coup in which the regime was convinced that the United States had a direct role in that, was that the, a turning point from a domestic standpoint that really heightened the regime's radicalization, or was it just simply very instrumental and a good excuse for the regime to sort of start a new phase in the Bolivarian experiment? Um, my opinion is that it didn't play a bigger role in making Chavez turn into the rabid anti-American that he became. Um, after the coup, he hardly blamed the Americans. 
Um, he uh, uh, was very conciliatory, and the Venezuelan government even invited the United States to be part of what was called Amigos de Venezuela, I think it was. Um, so it wasn't really 2002, and even through 2003, there were signs of uh, possible cooperation. However, like you say, it was instrumental. Um, the coup over time acquired a mythology of its own and the regime used it as a, a, a turning point. But that started happening much later, in my opinion, 2004, 2005, when the government was desperate to find clear examples of US aggression. In order for you to have this rhetoric, you need to somehow show evidence. And the coup worked uh, uh, rhetorically uh, uh, and uh, uh, as, uh, the justification for it, but the immediate impact was not a, uh, 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 in the direction of damaging the relationship. In fact, I think it brought the two countries together for a little while. Ambassador? I, I would certainly say that um, by 2007, um, uh, which is when I first um, met President Chavez uh, um, uh, as, for the presentation of my own credentials, uh, he typically characterized what had happened um, in that abortive uh, coup uh, as something that in, in which he believed the United States was somehow complicit. And this is notwithstanding all subsequent uh, um, investigations and, and notwithstanding the fact that in the early days right after the, the coup, um, there did not seem to be a, an especially pronounced um, uh, assertion of, of U.S. responsibility or complicity. Um, so in, in, in effect, I would support your sense that, that the the way it figured in the um, Bolivarian mythology as well as ideology grew over time. Well, you know, we all remember uh, the Summit of the Americas in April of 2009. The President Obama had just recently been inaugurated, and there's this picture, right, of, of, of President Chavez shaking the, the new president's hand and sharing uh, Eduardo Galeano's uh, uh, book. Uh, we'll recall, I certainly recall when the president said, even during the campaign, that, that the United States, that his administration would extend, always extend the hand of co cooperation, that, that we might have political or ideological differences with certain governments, but that the challenges that we all face, drug trafficking just to name one, really are issues that threaten all of us and that therefore require a multinational, uh, multinational uh, response. Uh, the sense was that the president did extend the hand and that President Chavez slapped it down. Was that, Professor Corrales, naive on the part of uh, President Obama? Uh, because after all, um, things seem to improve a little bit in the short term. I don't think it was naive. I think the United States understood that at that point, um, Chavez, that there was a high chance that Chavez was faking his sudden uh, um, appreciation of the United States. Chavez, during that summit, it started out being very critical of Obama, and he became very isolated in Latin America. And pressure from its peers compelled him to then fake uh, a certain interest. Um, but the Americans would have looked very foolish if having been provided with this opportunity, the United States would not have acted upon it. Right. So it wasn't naive, it's just that uh, um, it, it needed to happen uh, as a matter of uh, an opportunity where relationships could have improved. But after all, Ambassador, because perhaps of that meeting, you, you returned to Venezuela some, some months after, so it did have some impact. Oh, absolutely, and you know, there are a couple of points I'd make. In the first instance, it was at the, the summit in Trinidad and Tobago that the um, possibility of restoring relations at the ambassadorial level was raised. Now, during, during the government of, of President um, uh, Bush, or at least during my tenure as ambassador, we had made clear that we, we thought it was desirable uh, um, to have a practical, a functional relationship with the government of Venezuela, notwithstanding any differences that might exist. Right. And, <clears throat> and subsequently, when I returned as President Obama's ambassador, that was also part of our message. Um, now, I, I think that uh, conceivably, both sides 
um, welcome the opportunity to restore ambassadors uh, uh, to some degree as a, an earnest of their um, uh, good intentions um, uh, in, in, that is to, in, in front of the hemisphere. Um, and I think for the United States, having an ambassador return was, was a practical matter as well. You know, I'll just, I'll just add something because it, it frequently comes up in, as people think about whether or not we should be seeking to have an ambassador in a country like Venezuela. What I would remind you is that an ambassador is, is, uh, is a tool, right? It's not a reward for the country in question if we have relations with said country, um, although there are um, many, if you will, symbolic implications of having a personal representative of the president resident in the country. But I think we also saw this not only as um, a gesture of President Obama's willingness to extend the hand, but also as, as a way to um, restore full functionality to the embassy. But if, one is to, if one's argument is that President Chavez was committed to a confrontational relationship with the United States, why, why ask that you come back, return to Caracas, that he send an ambassador to Washington? Why uh, your successor, uh, when he was nominated, uh, the government in Caracas gave them the agreement, sort of the acceptance that initially. initially, right? Uh, so there was, in a sense, it seemed that there was a part of an effort here on the part of President Chavez to make the relationship more functional and not so confrontational. Or is there some, some balance, right, between we, want to, we don't want to be very friendly, but we also don't want to have you know, uh, uh, an extremely hostile relationship with the United States. I'll go with you, Mr. Ambassador, and then Professor Corrales. Well, in, in the first instance, I'd say it's difficult to try and, and capture what the, the Venezuelan government might or might not have been thinking um, internally um, uh, when this issue was raised. There is the practical matter that um, not only were we without an ambassador at our embassy, but there was no bilateral ambassador at their embassy, and we are, in fact, commercial partners, whether either side is happy with the bilateral relationship. So it's difficult to say, well, this is what they were trying to do or not do. What, what I do know is that um, uh, I never met with Chavez again after I returned. Uh, to Venezuela. I met periodically with uh, then Foreign Minister Maduro, but never with Chavez. Um, and so, insofar as we can infer anything from that, perhaps we can infer that they were more interested in having their man in, wa in Washington than our man in Caracas. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and um, I agree, and I want to expand on a point that the ambassador made. Um, because there is such a lucrative business relationship with the United States in Venezuela, having no U.S. ambassador doesn't seem to hurt them as much as might be the case in other environments. Uh, um, one possible cost, it's not the only cost, but one possible cost of a nation not having a representative of the United States government officially present is that that might hurt business. But the Business, the the, the, the uh, oil market is so guaranteed for Venezuela that they don't perceive this to be so costly. And I think this is something that Venezuela realized gradually. They came to the realization that it doesn't hurt them economically that much or otherwise to maintain uh, uh, no U.S. ambassador in Caracas. Uh, it wasn't an immediate realization, but after you left and they discovered that uh, the United States was still buying a lot of oil from Venezuela. Things were fine, and so. Well, let's not, let's not forget too that the that, that Venezuela has an ambassador in the United Nations, and they have an ambassador accredited to the OAS. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so the circumstances are in fact somewhat different mm -hmm. for the United States. There are two senior level um, uh, Venezuelan diplomats resident in the continental U.S., uh -huh. and they have a number of consulates around the U.S., whereas we do not have consulates. In, uh, um, in Venezuela. That's right. Let me ask you an issue that I think we're starting to see some evidence of, this, this idea of diminishing returns from anti-Americanism in, in Venezuela. 
Uh, I think this may have started with President Chavez, but it's, it's clear now under President Maduro, and that is sort of that the constant outlandish accusations about what the United States government is doing. More recently, we heard that apparently uh, President Maduro decided not to come to the United Nations General Assembly meeting because there was some plot to physically harm him. So the, these times that we've heard that, you know, or at least I remember the, the fact that the United States apparently provoked um, the earthquake in Haiti. Th those kinds of things, right? Or President Chavez's cancer. Yeah. Uh, it is now so constant and so exaggerated that now people are saying, really? Come on, in other words, it's starting to have a backlash effect rather than a positive effect which its intention is to strengthen the government. Are we starting to see, Professor Corrales, that phenomenon, particularly with, with President Maduro? Yes, absolutely, but with a caveat. Um, the anti-American rhetoric of the Chavez government was never electorally popular. It was popular within the small group of extreme radicals in Chavismo. And over the years, people have come to realize that this is uh, more of an excuse used by the government to try to explain away the things that are not working in, working in Venezuela. And Maduro embraced that speech for his campaign in April, and we see the results. He almost lost. Uh, so he wasted away many votes of Chavismo, in part because his campaign was only about anti-Americanism and uh, I am the son of Chavez. Those were the two things. So, so it didn't really work out that well for him. However, and this is the caveat, more and more Chavistas are buying into the argument um, because they need to be able to explain away the accumulation of disasters taking place in Venezuela. Like ten, six years ago, seven years ago, things didn't look as bad as they did now. Chavistas weren't that desperate for um, a, a, a scapegoat. I think all Chavistas now desperately need a scapegoat. And so the insincerity has spread among Chavistas, which is an interesting phenomenon. Before, it was sort of like uh, uh, it wasn't helping him that much. But now uh, the government, uh, uh, I think, is surrounded by folks who can only resort to that argument whenever they are confronted with challenges for the governance problems uh, afflicting Venezuela. Ambassador, you want to? No. In the first instance, I would say, after 14 years of government, and, and remember that President Chavez was elected in 1998, after 14 years of government, the Bolivarians, um, I, I think, own the difficulties with which they are struggling. It's, it's difficult to plausibly blame others if you have been running the show for 14 years. So there's, there's that. And so um, the, the, these periodic outbursts blaming the United States for um, uh, various economic or social problems simply don't carry the same weight in part because after now dozens of um, uh, denunciations of, of plots to um, uh, assassinate Chavez or to do damage to one institution or another, in, in which there has been no evidence of US complicity or even that said plots actually existed, it's hard to make a, um, much of an impact with some of those accusations. I think, I think that that um, plays um, a part in what the pollsters would say has been an erosion of support, particularly um, in this, the political center of Venezuela, um, often referred to in Venezuela as the ninis, right? Um, that ni oposición ni gobierno. On the other hand, um, anti-Americanism is a central part of their, their political ideology. And they, in fact, seem to resort to it um, when some of their own social and economic challenges become more severe. So where, where are we today? Um, it appears as though they will close this calendar year with inflation at around 40%. Um, that's what some people say. Um, uh, there are 
um, dramatic scarcities in the supermarkets. A country with the largest um, petroleum reserves in the world basically can't keep the lights on. They're having brownouts and energy, um, and, and there is energy rationing. And so it, it would appear as though the administration of President Maduro is facing severe crises in several fronts. Um, and at the same time, petroleum production has languished at levels well below the, um, the pre-strike levels from, you know, from 10 years before. So they, they've, they've got real challenges on the one hand, and there's an established pattern or precedent if you go back to, to President Chavez's um, public interactions, um, which involves um, including anti-Americanism uh, or, or an anti-American um, uh, element in, in much of the public discourse. Now, when it has been highly personal, I think over, over time, sometimes we have reacted to very specific problems. We've, we've, we've tended to want to, to regard some of this as unhelpful, but not right. things that, in which we need to get into a public debate. But we're, you know, policymakers in the United States are certainly keenly aware of, of, the, of this tendency to try and link the United States in the Chavista public's mind with any domestic problem. Um, Dr. Corrales, I wanna, you've been someone who's also worked on, on Cuba. Uh, and, and clearly uh, Cuba has a stake in the survival, the status quo in, in Venezuela. A lot of people speak to the issue of the number of advisors uh, that Cuban advisors that are uh, throughout Venezuela, but also some very close uh, in, in the government. Um, it is often said that there's a certain pragmatism almost to the way in which Cuba deals with the United States oftentimes, right? That it is not this sort of rabid anti-Americanism and that this approach that Maduro has taken is making the Cubans nervous. Um, how much do you think the Cubans can manage to the extent they have influence, right? Manage certain outcomes, rhetoric, policies in Cuba, I'm sorry, in Venezuela, so that thing doesn't, as, as they see it, unravel. And they could lose 100,000 or more barrels a day, overnight. Um, this is a very um, complicated question. And I think it gets close to some truth that um, that the country that we associate with the most rabid form of anti-Americanism in the end manages it well so that it doesn't mm -hmm. um, kill the patient, doesn't cause an OD case. And that when Chavez was going into excesses, they, they understood it because Chavez had these other attributes that allowed followers to forgive him for his excesses. But when you get someone like Maduro, who isn't that competent in so many areas, uh, then you feel very scared in his use of this, uh, to use the analogy, I'm sorry that I'm uh, uh, abusing it, this, this, this drug, and that they might be interested in making sure that, that there's no, uh, not an OD case. This is pure speculation, and I wanna say it uh, now, but uh, 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 that, that this is just speculation, I know nothing about it, but this incident, <laughs> well, in that this, case, you well, let me repeat it. And continue at length. Um, but, this is, <laughs> but you know, we're hypothesizing, and for the sake of academic argument, um, um, Maduro recently canceled his trip to the United Nations, and there are many, many reasons he might have canceled it. And one reason that people are articulating is that uh, the Cubans said, you're gonna do a terrible job. Um, you are not going to, you're gonna do more damage than not because you're ready to go with your craziness. Um, the, it's, it's, it's a very interesting situation because Maduro was very close to making it. They had actually found planes uh, that weren't Cuban to take them from Vancouver to New York City. And then they decided not to do it and you know, they discovered, the, the, the official argument is right. magnicide and lack of security. But people are speculating that this is a decision that, you know, let's not show Maduro's at his worst. Um, 
because he, does, he, he can't manage this anti-Americanism as well as other presidents have. Now, this is speculative, but it, it would make sense because we have seen moments, more so with Raul than with Fidel, in which the Cubans know that there are limits. Um, the, the Raul Castro government did not offer Snowden asylum, for example. Mm -hmm. this is, I don't want to read too much into this, but I, I think it does go well with your argument that they know how to uh, uh, manage the, the, the rhetoric, uh, the incendiary rhetoric of these leaders. Ambassador, That's a great point. Ambassador, we, um, we've, been, we've been talking a lot about Venezuela. Let's, let's look at it from the United States standpoint. Um, obviously, uh, our president doesn't publicly pay as much attention to Venezuela as the Venezuelan president pays and talks about the United States, right? Um, I think we can concede that point. Okay. Um. So <laughs> the question then is, is, is that a reflection of that the United States is not the United States government at high levels is not engaged, preoccupied, discussing issues related to Venezuela because it has, of course, many other issues to deal with. Uh, and, and therefore, do you perceive some, some vacuum in U.S. policy? I think what's happened is the United States, particularly since the Mar del Plata summit, um, at which the free trade area of the Americas was supported by everyone essentially except uh, Venezuela and its Bolivarian allies. I think since that era, what we have seen an evolution in US policy in the direction of A, working with those with whom, uh, uh, who wish to work with us and prioritizing that and, um, and a determination to have a positive agenda overall, to recognize that, are, that there are countries that do not wish to work with us um, though they may still trade with us, uh, um, uh, and embrace the openness of other countries, governments, or subgroups within the hemisphere, um, such as the new um, Alliance for the Pacific, um, and try to build together with them the kind of commercial environment that, and, 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 co and sort of atmosphere of cooperation um, that will, we think will help to assure uh, either prosperity or perhaps continued prosperity in, in the countries that, w with which we are working. And, and, it, and it's useful to note that, that we have, I think, now more free trade uh, agreements with the, uh, with, with the Western Hemisphere than with any other part of the world, right. number one. Right. Number two, again, to, to, to come back to Venezuela only briefly, um, our energy relationship with Venezuela, while important, is in fact diminishing. This is because um, we are producing more. You know, in I think only the last seven or eight years, um, our uh, the percentage of, of petroleum that we use, um, which is imported, has dropped from nearly 60 percent to around 40 percent. So the United States is producing a lot more. We're buying a lot more from Canada than we ever did, um, and Venezuela at the same time has been consciously seeking to develop other markets. And so this relationship, and, and of course that the principal alternative market, um, has been China. So that relationship has been shrinking. Um, and there's another factor in all of this, and that is we have seen a proliferation of the development of new organizations within the hemisphere. Um, the development of most of these, including UNASUR, um, has largely been applauded by the United States as um, uh, conducive um, to good um, internal regional management. In general, the United States is in favor of cooperation. Um, uh, and we haven't seen, I think, that an expanded role for the United States in, in some instances would be welcome in a hemisphere with which we are trying to have productive relationships. So, um, I think the, the, this administration has increasingly focused on um, those countries most interested and ready to work with us. Yeah, I think that's. And that's the that's the real that's you know that's the reality out there. I don't think that that we are. Um, uh, I think we are aware that Brazil uh, that Venezuela um, 
has actively campaigned to roll back U.S. influence in the, in the uh, region. But at the same time, I think it is widely perceived that Venezuela's own influence has receded from a high mark that it reached some years ago yeah. um, and been supplanted um, um, to some degree by the influence of uh, Brazil. Let me, let me stay with that. You, as you mentioned, you were ambassador both during the Bush and, and, and in the uh, Obama administration. Could you tell me a little bit about, fr from your purchase ambassador, what were the areas of change uh, and the areas of continuity between one administration and the other on the issue of Venezuela? First of all, there, there was more um, continuity than change. And this is because our, our, our relationship didn't, in fact, change um, uh, with Venezuela when um, President Obama was inaugurated. We had, of course, when he was inaugurated, we had no ambassador. We had had no ambassador for some months. We had a trade relationship, um, um, and we had um, very little political contact, and, and in the uh, particularly in the waning years of the Bush administration, the Venezuelan um, uh, government, and particularly President Chavez, was, um, was distinctly um, hostile to the United States. The, the message when, uh, that, that I brought, typically, um, uh, in both public and private, when I got to Venezuela, was, look, um, this doesn't make sense. We are neighbors. We are... Um, your logical trading partner, as well as your de facto largest trading partner, um, we are equally threatened by the corrosive effects of the international drug trade. Um, and basically, Venezuelans and Americans like each other, which I believe there are some Venezuelans here tonight, I would say is mostly manifestly true. Right? Um, so we ought to be able to have a better relationship. But and I brought the same message back with me when I came as President Obama's ambassador. One of the things that I would focus on, um, or that I would, I would um, uh, return to, is curiously, I had a number of encounter, encounters with um, uh, President Chavez in my first incarnation as ambassador for President Bush, but I was never received again by President Chavez when I returned as President Obama's ambassador, um, which I think speaks to their uh, um, increasing um, sort of sense, which Javier very correctly underscores, that um, they had decided they could get along very well, thank you, without a dialogue at the highest level with an ambassador. And, and more recently, that has manifested itself in, in their um, resistance um, uh, to first the, the nomination um, or the appointment of uh, Ambassador Larry Palmer and subsequently the frustration that has attended um, efforts to um, uh, renew the relationship in some important way. Uh, Professor Corrales, sometimes we hear, uh, I, I certainly do, whether it's Venezuela or just Latin America in general, but focusing on Venezuela, the criticism is the United States is not doing enough, that it is absent, uh, that it is not using influence or leverage to shape, right? How would you react to that? Um, it always surprises me that this comes from um, people who are generally progressive and tend to be critical of U.S. influence. They use that a lot to, to criticize U.S. role in Venezuela. They're not engaging, that there has to be more uh, engagement with Venezuela. Uh, let me begin by saying that this point that we discussed a, sec uh, a few minutes ago about the United States being very busy with countries that do want to work with the United States is very true. And I would even say that since 2010, my sense is that the demand for U.S. engagement in the region has gone up significantly in many countries, except ALBA uh, plus Argentina, and that is a, it's the ALBA plus A, and that is not a significant economic group um, um, that, uh, for, compared to the rest of the region. But the problem is, there are two problems. I do not think that one of the parties to this possible bilateral relationship, Venezuela, is interested in it. So there isn't that much. I do have to say that if I had to criticize the United States to some extent on this question is that sometimes 
even to reasonable Venezuelans, not just Chavistas, but to reasonable Venezuelans, the Americans appear to be too exclusively focused on drugs. That drugs is the, the issue that the Americans care about, and, um, and it's not seen as imaginative. I don't think it's a fair criticism. It's a different criticism from it's not engaging enough. It's a criticism of uh, um, could there be other things uh, in addition to drugs that these two countries could talk about. For Venezuela, the strategy on drugs, in my opinion, has been um, we cannot launch a war against drugs because that would open a front that the Venezuelan state cannot um, uh, uh, prevail at. And so that explains why uh, pressures from the United States to, to be tougher on drugs um, uh, fall flat in Venezuela. The mistake that Venezuela has made is to assume that the green light to drugs was never going to come back and hunt them, which is what's happening this last week, actually, with uh, the incident in, uh, with Air France. Um, let me go back to the uh, New York example. An alternative explanation for why Maduro cancels the trip to New York is that, uh, for the first time, he is facing a serious internal crisis brought on by drugs. Um, Chavez and Maduro believed that they could be impervious to the drug trade, and this kept them unable to respond to U.S. pressures to get more involved in it. And that might change uh, from this point on. Um, so I, my, 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 my conclusion is there is not enough engagement because the Venezuelan government doesn't want it. Uh, and if I would be a little critical of the United States, it would be I think I, it, uh, the United States could be a bit more imaginative occasionally. Sure. May, yeah. may I just add, I, I, I understand that criticism, have certainly heard it before, um, and, and it may well be true. It's, it, it is certainly a valid line um, of, uh, of, for discussion in terms of how we engage in the hemisphere. What I would note in the case of Venezuela, and you know, we, are, we are joined the, this evening by uh, uh, General Doug Frazier, who uh, was, as many of you know, the former commander of Southcom. There have been some moments of curious cooperation, and one of them was um, following the earthquake in Haiti where um, uh, you know, we were obviously very active in, in, um, through Southcom and USAID and, and many uh, uh, voluntary organizations in the United States in trying to provide relief uh, to that um, poor, benighted uh, place. But the Venezuelans also mounted um, a significant effort. And what I recall from my time in Venezuela, it was they were prepared to talk with us from time to time um, about coordinating um, some of the modalities for the delivery of assistance um, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I, I understand, particularly in terms of our uh, public discourse, and, and I'm certainly one of those who could be faulted for having perhaps emphasized that too much, um, there were private conversations on other matters, rarely, but occasionally, and, and, um, and one of them was the uh, uh, the issue of, um, of Haiti and, and providing yeah. assistance following the earthquake. Um, we're going to ask a one or two other questions here. So we're going to turn it over to all of you for uh, questions and answers. So uh, get ready uh, to frame your questions. I know we're going to have a running mic. So, uh, but before we do that, um, Professor Corrales, you mentioned your book. Uh, this idea of a, of a Shannon doctrine, right? Uh, Tom Shannon was uh, Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere during both the Bush and the and, very beginning of the, uh, uh, of the Obama administration. And this is, this is a, a, I think, a very interesting point. You could certainly elaborate on, uh, on this, but there was a sense, right, you argue, that the administration, uh, Bush administration, and certainly into the Obama administration, decided that we were not going to rhetorically engage Caracas, mm -hmm. that we were going to lower the decibel, right, of criticism because we weren't just going to engage in this tit for tat because we were gonna lose, the United States was gonna lose. So let's be a bit more strategic as we engage. The, the criticism that I've heard of the Shannon Doctrine is that it, it makes a lot of sense, but what happens is that the United States then the abdicates a position on human rights and democracy that it's always been an advocate for in the region. And so as not to enter in this conflict to accentuate or exacerbate the tension between the United States and Venezuela, we are not 
the Shannon Doctrine would say, going to call him out on issues of democracy, human rights, freedom of expression, and then we've taken a back seat. How would you respond to that? This is, in fact, the essential criticism um, that we are not being truth to the ideals that we want to be uh, defending. But the problem is that the United States, in the eyes of many folks, uh, does not have a perfect record on human rights, does not have a perfect record on pressuring all regimes equally on human rights. And this is a vulnerability of the United States that the Venezuelan government could easily exploit to its advantage. Um, you know, they're picking on us. Uh, and, and let me give you a whole list of other areas in which the United States shouldn't. So I think that although the criticism is very strong and it's perhaps the cost of the policy, um, ultimately, Shannon should be credited for convincing the United States government, and especially the Bush administration when it was a little hysterical about Venezuela, to go easy rhetorically on, on uh, uh, the regime. There is a cost, absolutely, and the cost is that there is a lot of silence about a lot of what's going on domestically in Venezuela, and this is bad news for Venezuelans and, and the cause of democracy. But we don't have the David and Goliath confrontation that right. uh, the Bolivarian regime wants yes. to have. Ambassador, you want to read? Yeah, there are, there are a couple of points I would add to that. In, in the first instance, I would note that uh, the United States was never um, silent on these issues. And there are, there's annual reporting yep. to which on human rights, on press freedom, uh, um, et cetera, and, and the, um, as well as on counter-narcotics and other issues. And the, um, the Venezuelan government would react very strongly every year to those, um, to those reports. And then there were also instances such as um, former uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice's um, uh, comments on uh, the erosion of press freedom in Venezuela made, I believe, at the OAS General Assembly meeting in, I think it was Panama City one year. So there were, there were um, both regular reports um, and occasional um, uh, comments from uh, very senior officials that addressed these um, very issues. I always had the sense um, as a serving ambassador that many of the, uh, the parties or in some cases spectators to the disputes that were ongoing, to the, the, the tensions um, between the independent media and the government wanted us to weigh in, to weigh in much more regularly and, and to use a, a Spanish term, tajantemente, than we were. Um, but were we to be in there with both feet, they would also be highly um, uh, skeptical uh, about our motivation. And then finally, I would note that when some, sometimes people are, are, are looking at how we or others have reacted to, say, electoral developments um, in, uh, in Venezuela. I would note that the rest of the hemisphere has largely been willing to take um, Venezuela's uh, democracy at its own valuation. Right. And so notwithstanding the fact that we are all um, uh, signatories to the uh, Inter-American um, uh, Charter on, on uh, uh, Democratic Charter, as well as any number of other documents. Basically, um, on, on some issues, the United States would, um, would have been very much out of step with the yardstick that the rest of the hemisphere was using to evaluate developments um, within Venezuela. And so I, I think that we, we chose to, to keep our criticisms in very specific channels, to make those criticisms um, as appropriate in a variety of different um, uh, uh, media and, 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 and on different occasions. But we were certainly determined, which I, I think is part of what you're characterizing as the, the Shannon Doctrine, not to be drawn into um, spitting matches on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Great, well now let's turn it to the audience. Um, I'd ask uh, just a couple of things. One, that you uh, identify yourself. Uh, and second, that you be brief in your comment and question, and if you can direct the, the question to, to one of the panelists. So let me 
Uh, start right over here. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jose Hernandez, and a journalist. Uh, I have three questions. <laughs> oh, well, good. <laughs> well, one for you. How do you see the closing of the Venezuelan consulate here in Miami as a diplomatic view? One for you. How do you see commercially the closing of the diplomat <laughs> of the consular here in Miami? And one for you. How academically you could treat a country who say he is a democratic country and this, in the same time they proclaim the hegemonia comunicacional. Sorry, for that translation yeah. is typical. So if we could give sort of brief response. If you like. Well, the, the, um, the incident which led to um, the departure of uh, the Consul General of Venezuela here and the subsequent decision by the government of Venezuela to close the consulate all took place long after I had um, left Venezuela. Um, and I think it really speaks to, um, uh, it was really, if you will, a, a part of the domestic Venezuelan political narrative. Right? Um, that is to say, um, it, um, it responded to um, uh, a dynamic that was really internal to um, Venezuela as much as to anything that was happening in the bilateral relationship. But that's, that's how I see it from a distance. I was not a party to that, uh, to that story. Um, my, my sense is that um, it was Venezuelan citizens, as much as anyone, who was affected by the decision, who were affected by the decision to close the consulate. Right? Absolutely. And I think it was an electoral decision. Uh, it was a way to suppress the vote in, in, in Florida of uh, Venezuelans. Uh, if I understand your question, uh, I mean, it is often said that a, an election does not make a democracy, that it is a, a necessary element of democracy, but it's certainly not a sufficient one. And, and so, you know, in these, you say from an academic standpoint, these theories of uh, democracy and democratization and democratic rule certainly is something that is being increasingly questioned in Venezuela because of the government's restrictions on a whole host of different sectors, both in terms of the media, the private sector, and other areas. What is interesting, I think, uh, if not counterintuitive, as, as Professor Corrales has said, is that despite this, the opposition seems to be gaining space increasingly yeah. in, in, in occupying a presence and articulating a view that it did not perhaps five, seven, or, or 10 well, years ago. If I, just further to that point, because I think you're exactly right, what I would also note is that you know, if, if possible, let's step back for just a minute. Um, President Chavez was, over time, offering, you know, what what became an increasingly sort of unified vision of, for for the future of Venezuela. Until relatively recently, the opposition was not united. So it wasn't as though there was a, a single script that the Venezuelan uh, public could embrace as an alternative um, uh, to President Chavez. So it's, yeah. so you know, yes, they have been um, gaining space, and I think that is in part um, uh, be, because they have begun to demonstrate a capacity to work together um, and to develop a, um, uh, a program, at least of suggestions, to offer as an alternative to the Bolivarian vision. On this side, yes. Mike, uh, Mike, Mike, please. Hi, my name is Leandro. My major is international relations. Um, I have a question. Um, we recently, you mentioned that President Obama has been busy with the rest of the world and especially with the whole situation in Syria. And it is known that, that in Venezuela, like President Chavez and the dictator of Cuba has been backing off the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Do you think that the President Obama should, instead of reaching the coalition in other countries on the Western Hemisphere should reach to Venezuela and the, these countries that keep backing up the regime in, as a way of diplomatic negotiation? Um, look, I, I don't think that the Venezuelan support of the Syrian regime is the reason the Syrian regime remains active and uh, still in office, I think. Uh, there are um, domestic and international reasons for the survival of the regime. So. 
I think the Americans are correct in recognizing that there isn't a lot of leverage to be gained uh, on the Syrian conflict by going through um, Venezuela. What is interesting uh, is the Venezuelan government has criticized every single military intervention that the Americans have made since Afghanistan. But they have never stopped selling oil to the Americans during any one of those. It's an interesting dichotomy, and it tells you uh, 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 what, a, what, a, what a bizarre relationship Venezuela has. Uh, ultimately, the, Venezuela has provided the fuel, literal uh, and figuratively, to the very same military campaigns that um, that uh, it, the government criticizes so much. So, <laughs> so, so Venezuela supports uh, uh, both sides. <laughs> Let's go on this side, back to this side. Any yes, uh, my name is Ivan Ramos, and I'm uh, Venezuelan, living in, in the state of Florida. Um, I would like to just, first of all, say that uh, correct where you said that he almost lost, excuse me, he lost. I'm talking about Maduro, when you mentioned that he almost lost. So I like you allow me that correction. So he lost. The question is um, the relationship uh, with the OAS. I think that the United States, based on the OAS, has not been treating equally the Venezuelan case, as, for example, has been treating the case of Paraguay and the case of Honduras, if you recall. Okay, I think that uh, the way that the United States should have been backing the possibility of requesting the violations of the Constitution, which are right there, and it's to the eyes of the entire public. So would you please try to um, tell me what is the position of the United States, the OAS, on how to handle the violations of the Constitution of Venezuela? Ambassador. You were the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense more recently than I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. <laughs> You're right. Defense, state. You have the lead. <laughs> this, this is a difficult question, um, uh, which is, you know, why I, I'm going to turn to our associate, uh, Professor Corrales. Um, uh, no, I, you know, I think that, uh, um, being more serious, um, one of the things to remember is how the OAS works. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is you perceive as um, the difference between, say, the OAS's reaction to the Venezuelan election in April vice the OAS's um, reaction to the um, removal by the uh, Paraguayan Congress of President Lugo. But the, the mission which I think was, in fact, led by Foreign Minister Patriota of Brazil. The mission um, which went to Paraguay after the, um, uh, the Paraguayan legislator, legislature had essentially voted to impeach um, President Lugo wasn't an OAS mission. It was an UNASUR mission, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think that it's important to understand that we are actually looking at um, a much more complicated situation these days in Latin America with respect to international organizations. You have CELAC, which is the community of Latin American and Caribbean countries, and CELAC does not include either the United States um, or Canada, but does include Mexico and the Central American countries. And you also have UNASUR, um, which has a defense council as well, um, and, 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 and which includes only the countries of South America. And so the lead in both of those, well, in that conflict in particular, in Paraguay, was actually taken by UNASUR. And I would say that there were um, substantive differences um, uh, that were very important uh, between the complaints of irregularities um, in Venezuela and the fact that the president of Honduras had been removed by his military and expelled to um, uh, another country, that these were very different circumstances, um, and that it wasn't um, at all accepted by the collective, which is um, uh, the OAS, that there had been a breach of democratic practice in April in, um, 
in Venezuela, but there was a consensus that there had been a breach in Honduras. And that largely explains, yeah. I think, the difference in the, um, in the way the OAS reacted uh, between Venezuela and Honduras. And as I said, in the other instance, which was a very complicated one, and uh, about which um, Dr. Mora, I think, is, is uh, uh, um, particularly a, a particularly good source as, as someone who's written extensively on, on Paraguay. In the case of Paraguay, it was, it was complicated because it was apparently a constitutional change, you know, a mechanism that was in fact um, um, literally contemplated in the Constitution. So it was a constitutional measure that was taken, um, but one which, despite its apparent constitution constitutionality, appeared to the, um, the UNASUR presidents as a violation of the spirit of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And so there were, there were very different, different circumstances in the three countries and different organizations at times involved. The OAS is a consensus basis. If there's no consensus, it doesn't move. Right. Uh, on this side, yes. My name is Mario Di Giovanni. I'm part of the Venezuelan Student Alliance, the Venezuelan student organization here at FIU. One question that I have, especially in the last few weeks with uh, different things that Maduro has done and the questions regarding his capacity to lead the country, do you think, especially Mr. Ambassador that's, that has met him, do you think that we might be underestimating him when he, he as a foreign minister, actually had some achievements such as UNASUR, CELAC, even the entry to Mercosur? Do you think that we might have this risk of underestimating the capacities that Maduro has, especially in foreign relations? Thank you. Well, first of all, the, the, the problems that the Venezuelan government faces right now are very serious. Um, uh, the economic problems in, in particular, and, and I would say they're largely of their own making. Time will tell whether um, President Maduro um, uh, is the appropriate person, is the best person is, um, to, to face those challenges, whether he can successfully do so. Something I, I have mentioned um, in, in a couple of other interviews that I would, I would simply note is that there, there, there has historically been this Mm, a certain uh, tendency to dismiss um, uh, Nicolas Maduro because he began um, his working life as a bus driver and union leader. First of all, I would say in the United States of America, um, we ought to be very, very careful not to assume that because someone was a working person, they, they don't have the capacity to exercise other responsibilities as a first point. The second point I would note is um, you know, we'll see how all of this works out, but he didn't, if you will, just get off the bus and arrive at the presidential palace. He had years in the legislature, and then as foreign minister, and then as vice president. So I won't make any, any, any comments on his, his, his ability, but I would note that um, he was in um, a series of very senior positions within the government for a very long time. Um, look, um, there are two things. Um, in Latin America, since uh, the year 2002, it's very difficult to defeat an incumbent president. So that is a large advantage that Maduro has, um, an incumbent president, number one. Number two, he has proven very successful in stabilizing the situation politically. Uh, number three, of course, he's uh, a competent person. He made it to the top. He was selected among several contenders. There's gotta be something to him. But, and, and, and finally, he, leaders facing big crises generate a capacity to emerge. I mean, this is, a, this is the human spirit. In adversity, the best of us comes out. So I don't want to underestimate it. I don't think we do. But it is very important to understand that he's facing huge challenges and that um, and the problem is not so much we outside of Venezuela underestimating it, but his followers. This is where the issue is. I continue to believe that his followers underestimate him, and uh, there's the risk that they could entrap him his somehow. His own followers. His own followers, his own followers. Um, and this is not a, 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 a pretty scenario for any country when the leader of a country is um, um, uh, second-guessed by um, the followership. May I add something? The other thing that occurs to me, and, and if you'll forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm to some degree thinking out loud, 
But it also occurs to me that there are, there are two ways in which, in which we might think about President, Ch President Chavez and Chavismo in connection to um, uh, President Maduro. On the one hand, he was helped immensely in his campaign to be elected in his own right by the fact that President Chavez, in his last public appearance, endorsed him. But he, he then ran as the, um, uh, the heir to all that was President, uh, President Chavez. Now, many of the most serious problems um, President Maduro is facing, I would argue, are at least in part a consequence of the failed economic policies of more than a decade. But when you have run as the heir to another political leader, it is especially difficult to abandon policies associated with that leader and on the basis of which, to some degree, your own successful election depended. Right? Hmm. On this side? Yes, in the back. Yes. Hi, my name is Orlando Rodriguez. I'm studying political science and international relations. Uh, I would like to ask, um, we know that the Venezuelan government has a strong production of oil and it funds governments uh, in Cuba, governments in Ecuador, governments in Bolivia. So why doesn't the U.S. foreign policy focus more on establishing a consolidated democracy in Venezuela so that it would help disintegrate these governments that Venezuela is funding and thus make those countries weaker and so that we'd have more established democracies in Latin America as a whole? Professor Corrales. Look, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, let me let me say that it's very um, delicate to believe that democracy comes from external actors or even the United States. Um, it's it's not that easy. It's not a, it's not a, it's not like building a legal Lego uh, 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 toy. It's it's very complicated, and and we don't have a great experience. We have major successes, but we've also had major blunders in trying to do that, and many cases in which the United States is just neutral in its in impact. But let me just say something about, something optimistic about uh, the future of democracy in Venezuela. Uh, democracy is the game between the opposition and the government. The government has to somehow give concessions to the opposition, which is hard to do because the more concessions you give, the more you increase your chances of stepping down. And the opposition has to pressure the government, but it cannot become too subversive. Otherwise, it's going to face a bad, bad uh, response from the government. And I think this game, which is very delicate, has been played very well in Venezuela, despite all, all, all that we have said. Um, the Venezuelan opposition today is, to repeat what has been said before, the strongest in Latin America in terms of its numbers and in terms of its unity. In Latin America, and in many countries, the opposition tends to divide. Even in traditional bipartisan countries, like Chile, the opposition is divided today. Other traditional bipartisan countries, like Colombia and Costa Rica, are now becoming more divided. And in Venezuela, what we are seeing is an opposition that has defied the trend in the rest of the region and has converged into a cohesive force this is the best thing that can happen to a country where you're imagining a bargaining negotiation between government and opposition. It's not all that you need, but it's a better ingredient for democracy than having an external actor coming in and uh, uh, hoping to introduce democracy into the region. So though things look bad in general, because there's a lot of mistrust on both sides, we do have now a certain uh, tie of forces which I think is a sign for optimism and might compel the actors to sit down and, and, and begin to negotiate in a moderate way, maybe. Let's go over here on this side. Yes, gentlemen. Like that. May I, can I, let me just throw one thing out there. You would be very, I think, mistaken to assume that either Evo Morales or Rafael Correa um, depend for their success on, uh, absolutely on the continued generosity of the Venezuelan government. Correa has oil. 
um, uh, Bolivia has gas, um, lithium, and other things. And, and while it may well be that they have received assistance over time, sometimes quite generously, um, I don't think that their success, um, um, or I don't think we can adequately explain their success in recent years simply in terms yeah. of assistance from um, uh, an, external, an external player. Um, and um, that would be true even if we were the external player. Yeah. Yes, my name is Jose Antonio Gonzalez. I'm also of Venezuelan origin. Uh, and uh, I, my surprise. question is towards the ambassador. Another Closer? Surprise. Okay. My question is towards the ambassador uh, present and their failed policy in general towards South America. Now I say, I said it failed. Now it's a, the policy cannot be uh, considered a success when a country such as Venezuela, which was the first one to go to the left in the Latin America, in other words, in, in South America, and then all of the other countries, now you have a whole continent in the U.S., okay? It, it started with Venezuela. And the U.S. of doing more of the same, which in other words is nothing, uh, has given this results that you have now a whole continent that's against the U.S., and its people are suffering the consequences. People in Venezuela and the U.S. is also suffering consequences because of this failed policy. To me, it's always been you know, somewhat of a, of, a, of a hazy, how can so many intelligent people in the State Department, of, uh, well educated, come to so, so many times to wrong conclusions, okay? That to me is, is, is very... Uh, much, I'd much like to you to expand on this. Uh, oh, well, I haven't finished. Uh, I'll, I'll I have you do with, 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 uh, with, when, your turn to, uh, when you have your turn. Uh, in, in Venezuela, it's interesting because the Venezuelan situation didn't start with Chavez. It started in the sir, early 20th century. We need century, to make it brief, sir. And it went from the, from the foundation of the Communist Party in Venezuela. And it continued on you know, it's with Fidel in 1949 when he visited uh, Romulo in power sir, after visiting him sir, in, in... Sir, I'm asking you to be brief. I, we heard your well, question. Well, we, we've listened to you. Just let me finish. No, have to say. We, we don't have time. We want to give as many people well, a chance. Well, this is a democracy, and you have the right to freedom of speech, so I can use the freedom of speech. You have had, and I've asked you to be brief. I have, I have no I'm reason that one why to... We have others who want to speak as well. Well, I know, but you took your time and let me speak, so that's why I'm taking a little longer. Anyway, my question, my question, okay. we my, my question, in other words, is, in other words, uh, how do you expect to achieve positive results, in other words, through uh, non-subvertive, subvertive methods, or in other words, through, through, through flowers, with flowers, in a regime that controls everything, they control the military, they control the, 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 the the voting process, they control the, 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 the Congress, or the Assembly as they call it now, uh, and they do not participate, and, and not only that, Justice Chavez, they, are, they act always in bad faith, okay? Never in good faith. So the U.S. trying to negotiate with a country that is consistently acting in bad faith and are trying to open up new channels in order to achieve results. So okay, we, 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 we've heard you. Thank you. Ambassador. Well, first of all, let me begin by saying I, I, I actually sympathize with this sense that um, it's, the, the, first, the, the general sense um, that at times it appears as though um, uh, our influence is waning in the hemisphere um, and that our efforts to build um, a more unified, um, a more cooperative region for the benefit of all um, essentially ran aground. Um, uh, I get it. I get it. And certainly those of us who worked in the hemisphere for a long time um, have felt frustration um, um, on a number of fronts. Now that said, that said, what I would invite you to consider um, is, uh, I, I guess, are two or three things. One, um, the influence that the Bolivarian Revolution has had in the region, I think, has waned very substantially, and the support that the Bolivarian Revolution has domestically, if we judge only from the vote um, in April, um, 
um, the, the results would suggest that it, that has, it has been weakened um, very substantially internally as well. At the same time, others around the region have seen, um, uh, we have seen their relationships with the United States, again, in the region, strengthened. And from the, the point of view of the United States, the, um, the fact that now 42% of all of our exports flow to the region is one of the, the, the measures, I think, that um, people in Washington look at um, as an indication of success. At the end of the day, we are, in fact, um, uh, trying to build a hemisphere in, in which democracy, but also market economics and cooperation in, in any number of areas is the norm. It has not been the norm in Venezuela. We have not succeeded in rebuilding that relationship. And to a degree, um, what I would say is it is a new um, era. The United States is not going to intervene um, uh, directly in Venezuela. In point of fact, um, uh, we have long believed that it was up to Venezuelans to, say, you know, to, to solve their own problems, and we hoped that the rest of the hemisphere would be supportive of, of that effort. You can fault the United States for failing to intervene adequately, um, sufficiently, or regularly enough, but in point of fact, if you look at the numbers on our activities in, in the hemisphere, um, I think, as Professor Corrales has said, there appears to be a, a rising interest in cooperation with the United States in many places. Um, and we know that our um, uh, commercial in interests in the hemisphere are, are stronger than ever. Clearly, clearly, um, the, um, the relationship with Venezuela has been a neuralgic one for the United States. Um, and we see the, um, the difficulties that Venezuelan citizens themselves are experiencing, whether you define them in economic terms or in political terms, um, as unfortunate. But I think we would also um, be doing the facts a misservice, a disservice, if we didn't recognize that to a very large degree throughout all of this uh, very disputed and, and sometimes tempestuous, and tem, uh, tempestuous period, there was a lot of support for President Chavez at a certain point. Right? And there are reasons for that, historical reasons for that. Um, uh, but I remember when I was in uh, Venezuela, um, after a number of votes of one sort or another, talking privately with pollsters in many places Sometimes, and in the very moment in which there would be um, public protestations that even if the vote count was right, the sentiment of the people had somehow not been adequately reflected in that vote. And you know, and some of the Venezuelans in the audience, I'll bet, will agree with me, even if somewhat bitterly, the fact of the matter is that what a lot of the pollsters would pick up, particularly in the early days when there was not a united opposition alternative, was that President Chavez did in fact have a measure of support that was largely reflected, um, uh, that was, in which there was a correlation between the polling and the voting. So I, I, would, I, I, I would beg to differ with um, um, our, um, our, uh, our guest, uh, um, the gentleman in the audience, in suggesting that um, U.S. policy in the aggregate has failed. That doesn't mean it has fulfilled all of our expectations, and certainly there was immense disappointment after the FTAA basically went belly up. Um, but there are any number of ways to measure uh, success in the region, and by some of them, there has been considerable success. Thank you. Maybe do you want to say something? If, if I would like to hear another Please. question. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, um, Let's go to this side. Uh, gentleman right there, yeah. Hi, my name is Carlos Tagliafico. I'm a Venezuelan. I'm, I'm a political science mayor. And um, I was wondering, um, I know the United States is known for its reputation to, for, to spot opportunity. So Venezuela is going through a very difficult economical process. 
they are actually on the edge of an economic implosion uh, due to corruption, due to revenue, due to the relations with China and Russia. And I was wondering if, I know the opposition has been looking for support for the United States uh, in political and diplomatic sense. And I was wondering if the United States sees Venezuela as an opportunity to get more economical um, support from Venezuela after the implosion, the implosion of the economy, because it's gonna be, there's going to be a coup, according to history, uh, if everything keeps going as the way it's going. Um, and that's going to see, the United States going to see an opportunity to get into Venezuela and have more economical support from Venezuela to restore, as it happened in Argentina with Peroni, when United States support and try to pay all his all the debt from Argentina. So, do you see, do you think United States is waiting for that moment to happen to get more support to Venezuela, or it's just not a matter of that the United States not very uh, involved in the it's not very affected for the um, situation in Venezuela. Professor Gonzalez. Um, you know, I I don't think the United States is. Uh, maliciously waiting for the country to hit rock bottom to act. Um, uh, the United States, as I mentioned, as we mentioned, continues to buy all the oil that Venezuela sends. The United States knows that the moment that it, if, if it were to be discovered that the U.S. government is helping the opposition directly, that'll be the end of the opposition. Um, so so um, I, 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 I think it's a question of being very cautious because, as the ambassador was saying, there have been major gains in terms of where Chavismo and Madurismo is today from where it was in 2007. Um, this is the weakest it's ever been uh, by uh, all accounts, objective accounts. It could revive, but, uh, um, and, and there's the hope that uh, um, uh, there would be uh, um, some kind of liberalization in the regime. Um, when the ambassador was saying that um, the spread of Chavismo in the region has declined, he's completely right. Since 2008, um, this is a number I'd like to repeat, there have been 15 elections in Latin America. In not one of them, there was a Chavista-like candidate who won. And if there was one Chavista-like candidate, they, they retracted big time. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, this is politically a, a very uh, favorable government for, for those who are in favor of democracy and, and normalization of politics in, in, in Venezuela. Um, the opposition in Venezuela is very careful not to be seen as a product of external actors. It is not. It isn't. And it has done, again, very well uh, um, considering uh, um, um, the, the harsh circumstances that it needs to operate under. There are many serious laws in Venezuela that ban, that ban um, helping political parties from abroad, and not just political party organizations. And so this could be a, a very um, uh, suicidal thing for the opposition to pursue. A question on this side? Yes, the gentleman right up front. So, how can you explain the, uh, so to say, tolerance of the United States towards the Venezuelan um, politics vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, 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 this, this hostile history with Cuba? Thank you. You know, this, this sort of reminds us of the, of the question that we keep asking and we asked earlier, which is this perception of how can the United States let this happen? Why is the United States not more involved in trying to shape outcomes within Venezuela and other places? Right. How would you and, respond? Well, in, in the first instance, let's remember that virtually all the countries of Latin America have relations with Cuba. And most of the hemisphere um, is critical of U.S. policy toward Cuba and has been critical of U.S. policy toward Cuba for a very long time and would consider it um, inappropriate, unhelpful, and, 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 and corrosive of our relationship with any of the rest of them um, for us to use their relationship with Cuba um, as 
a measure of the, the sort of relationship we have with them or that we would like to have with them. So um, this, this notion that this is one of those things that we can control or that, for which our tolerance um, is a requirement, I, I think is inherently mistaken. Now what is the relationship? Cuba apparently gets about 100,000 barrels of oil a day from Venezuela in exchange for what is essentially a series of barter arrangements or deeply discounted and, and often um, uh, postponed payments. There are many Cubans in Venezuela and they are um, uh, present in a wide range of, uh, of government activities. It is clear that uh, Venezuelan support is critical to the economic viability of the island. Uh, it is not necessarily, conversely, critical um, to Venezuela that Cubans be present, but um, it, it, it was certainly um, of profound importance. The relationship with, with Fidel in particular was of profound importance to, um, to Hugo Chavez. Um, and, and the relationship has survived um, his death. Um. Let me try this, um, see whether it, it, it um, uh, helps the audience see the way I see the, 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 the issue. We discussed the problem of overestimating U.S. capacities. You know, how can the United States tolerate as if, as if it were something that the United States could easily fix? But leaving that question aside, there is the issue of, imagine that you're the President of the United States and you have only 24 hours, and you're asked to consider the really serious threats to the planet, Korea, Iran, Syria, the radicalism of the Arab Springs, the economic crisis in Europe, the most important trading partner of the United States, the terrible drug problem in Mexico and the Caribbean, uh, the rise of China, the problem of India and Pakistan. Um, terrorism. Terrorism, uh, um, um, even though that has been declared a less of important issue. How much time do you have for the Cuba-Venezuela issue? How much time do you have for Bolivia saying, you know, we're going to nationalize Repsol? Um, it doesn't rise to the level of national security threat. I'm not, I don't mean, I, I don't want to be demeaning to Latin America because these are issues that are very important to the region, but the scale of the threats that the United States government has to contend with is of a different scale. And, and that might be the explanation for why the tolerance. Uh, um, even if we get a president who feels that, yes, I can come in and fix it, um, it doesn't seem to be the priority, and, and maybe rightly so. Uh, thank God, thank God that Venezuela hasn't gone nuclear. Thank God that Venezuela doesn't have the level of, um, um, doesn't pose the level of threat that these other nations pose. And that its ideological influence is receding. It's receding. And that our economic relationship with, um, or at least our dependence on Venezuela oil is also going down. Yeah. And so there is an element of, there is no time for a, a, a crisis that is not that, of that magnitude. The, the, the subtitle of my book with Carlos Romero says a mid-level security threat. And this is kind of the point that we want to make. There is a threat. There is a danger. There are risks. But compared to the spectrum of uh, national security threats we face, it's just not up there. This is not fair. Uh, Stephen Wetzel, United States Southern Command, and, and I'm not a Venezuelan. A few years ago, um, then President Chavez and President Ahmadinejad of, of Iran appeared to be working very, very hard to develop a, a political and economic and perhaps even a military relationship between those two countries. So now that Chavez is gone and Ahmadinejad is no longer president of Iran, what becomes of this relationship between these two countries? Or was there ever really a relationship anyhow? Ambassador, I'll, <laughs> I'll give that one to you. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm relieved to be able to speak um, first um, and uh, pass the baton quickly. Um, but in, you know, there was certainly a relationship and there was um, it, um, obviously an effort by President Chavez um, to, to deepen that relationship. Um, both the Iranians and the Venezuelans for the most part um, 
tended to insist that it was um, exclusively a commercial relationship. Obviously, we've we've seen uh, ex you know deep expressions of deep concern from from many other quarters. Um, and to some degree, uh, President Chavez was happy to act as a kind of gateway to the hemisphere for the Iranians, who then looked to expand their presence into uh, Bolivia and elsewhere. But I think, I think the question of whether that relationship, now that there has been a change of leadership in both uh, countries, is, is a good one, um, particularly in the wake of the new Iranian pre president's um, uh, speech at the United Nations. Um, and the apparent uh, predisposition of the Obama administration um, to uh, make renewed efforts um, at, um, at dialogue with Iran. You wanna, uh, I mean, I, I do want to say that if there's something that the United States has always watched with concern is this relationship. Sure. And it's interesting that Venezuela publicly did not cross the very same line that the United States clearly said to Venezuela, don't cross, which is go nuclear. Maybe it did, but it, it's, uh, it's, it, they, it, there doesn't seem to be evidence. And, um, you mean provide support to the, the Iranian and effort? Provide support and even perhaps even develop its own. Uh, uh, mm. uh, that, would, that would be unrealistic, but um, it's, it's, it is the one thing that could convert the Venezuela issue into a high level security threat. So um, the government has been, I think, not to cross a certain line with Iran. We have time for one more question, but before I, 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 I want to first just uh, take a, a 30 seconds to thank um, a few people. One is, is my team at the Latin American Caribbean Center uh, for putting this event together. Uh, Sally Simudio, thank you. Vivian Diaz is here. The Malocas team, I know, has been tweeting this. Uh, thank you all for uh, the work you did in helping us put this together. Yes, I will be relying upon you again to do the next one and that we will look forward to. And finally, uh, I want to thank, uh, as I like to say, my boss, uh, John Stack, uh, for his support, not only of this event, but all things, all things lack. Thank you. Thank you, John. A and also, uh, finally, definitely finally, I want to thank our two guests. Uh, I think this has been a, a great debate, great discussion. Thank you for helping us launch this format. I think it worked pretty well. I've always dreamed of being a talk show host, so <laughs> I think we'll do this again. Okay, let's go to the last uh, question. Right here, student. Good evening, my name is uh, Iri Rodriguez. I'm a grad student at the uh, Latin America Caribbean Center. My question is, uh, I guess, two part. Uh, you, we've spoken right now about the influence or the relationship between Iran and Venezuela. I want to keep it on that side of the world uh, with China. We know that China has uh, financed a lot of um, endeavors for the Venezuelan government. And now with Maduro at president, um, what is the foreseeable future there in, that, in terms of that relationship? Uh, recently, a few months ago, China and Nicaragua uh, came to an agreement about building a canal there, which they have many obstacles, obviously, but what, what is uh, the future, foreseeable future there in terms of the Chinese and Venezuelan relationship? You know, that's um, interesting. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big question. I would just share with you um, before I, I get to, your, to my answer that um, when I appeared before the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee for my confirmation hearing, I, I, was, I, I went before the committee with two other ambassadorial nominees. Now, in the usual course of things, um, if you're in Washington getting ready for a confirmation, as someone who has joined us very late in the evening um, would know, as she was working with me then, um, one spends a lot of time trying to figure out how you would answer virtually every imaginable question about the bilateral relationship. Rather to my surprise, the first question to me and also to both of the other ambassadors that day was what we thought of China's ro uh, role in the hemisphere. 
All three of us, boom, boom, boom. What do you think, what do you think, what do you think? Not quite that abruptly, but pretty close. In the case of Venezuela, um, it's, um, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's worth noting that we're, we're not sure this week exactly what has come out of President Maduro's most recent visit. There are somewhat conflicting reports. But setting what we don't know aside, what we do know is that the Chinese have apparently loaned something on the order of $40 billion to Venezuela. And a substantial portion of that debt is going to be amortized through, the, through oil shipments over time. So what I would suggest to you um, now constitutes a challenge for the Venezuelan government is that realizing that a portion of what they're going to send um, will have already been paid for and the money spent, if they don't wish to fi find themselves in a, an even more serious cash crunch in the future, they're going to have to increase oil production. Because total oil rents, if part, the, part, of, if part of those rents has already been spent, um, in the form of effectivo, cash, will in fact dip a little as they begin paying more and more of the, uh, the debt with product, since that product will not be generating new cash. Right? So yeah. that's, that's the challenge um, to the government. Now, can they meet it? Big question. It is beyond dispute, even OPEC now acknowledges that Venezuela has the largest reserves in the world, larger than Saudi Arabia's. But, as I mentioned earlier in the evening, unless we are, unless all of the sources um, that I have, with which, with, with which I have checked, are wrong about ve Venezuelan production levels, Venezuelan production continues to labor at pre-strike levels. Right? So they have yet to make the major leap forward that they believe is possible and which their reserves would suggest is achievable. But it hasn't happened yet. And so that's a, that's a challenge to the government going forward. Um, I, I, I agree fully. Um, um, let me give you a, uh, the perspective of the ways in which China is helpful to US interest in Venezuela. Um, on the one hand, it is not helpful in that it is providing the financing that is preventing the government, eliminating incentives for the government to do necessary reforms. That is the bad news. It is a bailout that is producing a moral hazard. But the good news is that anything that China does to help Venezuela improve its energy sector, to create more oil, is a public good for the United States because it eases up on the supply crunch of the world oil economy. So in that sense, the United States and China, as consumers of oil that they both are, uh, have an incentive in Venezuela's supply expanding because even if it doesn't end up in the United States and it ends up in China, it will put downward pressures on uh, oil prices. And that is a terrific outcome for oil consumer nations like the United States. Thank you all for being here tonight. Hope to see you in future LAC programs and activities. Thank you.